Well, praise the Lord. You know, I, I just want to give a little shout out to our team here because, um, of course, you guys realize that this whole thing that we experience on Sunday mornings, this is not the church. You guys know that, right? Church is not a building. It's not a Sunday morning meeting. The church is a family. And yet the, the, the Sunday morning gathering is a very significant part of the life of the, the community. And so we don't have our own church building, so we meet here in this rented high school auditorium. And all of this stuff gets set up and torn down every week, which is quite a feat, actually. This is the first of two services. And to make matters even more complicated, many of our team members, especially the leaders like Austin and Ashley and the ones that lead the Make It Happen crew, they actually are also the ones that do our impartation breakfasts, our partner breakfasts around the world. So a bunch of us came from Chicago last night, and they were here this morning setting up early. They set up the, the ballroom in Chicago, and now they set up the, uh, the, the auditorium here this morning, burning the candle at both ends. So we honor you guys. Also, Jackie Baker, who, is, uh, who, who was just leading here, he was leading worship in, in Chicago, and... You know, Pastor Russ was there, and I was there, and you would never know it, right? We all look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So um, I want to just mention something very quickly before I, I dive into the, uh, the message this morning, and I want to do it quickly because I always run out of time, and, and it always uh, frustrates me, so I'm going to try to get to it quicker today. But before we do that, I want to just remind you about something that is happening next Sunday morning. Everybody say, next Sunday. So next Sunday, we are going to be doing something we've never done as a, as a church, and it might sound strange to you, but I want you to understand that this is one of the key Sunday mornings in the life and the history of this church, and this is why. We are going to be, in, in a few months' time, we are going to be launching the first um, campus after we've launched Nations Church. Now, of course, Nations Church is about a year and a half old. We are about to launch our first campus, which is going to be happening in Oak Ridge. And um, already, you know, I don't know how many people are on that launch team. It's, it's already over 100 people on the launch team. We've hardly begun to recruit. I told these guys, we're going to run out of space before we even open the doors. And we're going to have to start on the next one. But um, in order to launch that campus, which, by the way, you guys know where Oak Ridge is, right? This is, this is very um, likely one of the most needy places in Central Florida and certainly in the Orlando area. And so we are bringing the light of the gospel right there. And people are getting saved every week. They're going to be discipled. We're going to see that community transform in Jesus' name. I really do believe that. But in order to do that, we've got to, we've got to launch this right. That's why we take months in preparation, and that's why when it launches, it doesn't launch as this little thing that takes 10 years to ramp up. We, we launch with a bang. And so in order to do that, we need to be able to raise some money on the front end to invest in the building, in the advertising, in the different you know, interest parties. There are lots of things that need to take place, and we've budgeted about $250,000 for that. And so our, our hope is and our prayer is that next Sunday, we are going to raise that money in a very special offering that we're calling a Kingdom Builders Offering. Okay, and so what we're, we're asking you to do is, is, you know, Paul said let everyone decide beforehand what he's going to do without any compulsion, come willingly. That's, that's the context into which the verse that we all know is spoken, that God loves a cheerful giver. And you know why you can be cheerful? Because when you're not giving under compulsion, and when you're giving because the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, you know that he's going to bless you, and you can give with a generous, free, joyful, happy heart. And so I'm believing that next week is going to be one of the most exciting weeks we've ever had because we're going to bring those gifts like they did when they built the Temple of Solomon. And I believe we're going to raise that $250,000, and we're going to see a, a major stronghold in this area come crashing down for the sake of the glory of God, the kingdom of God. Amen? So I want you to be thinking about this. I want you to be praying about it. If you're married, talk to your spouse. If you're not married, just do it. <laughs> and come next week prepared to give in a big and generous way. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, we can do this. You're going to look back 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and you're going to say, I helped to start that. I did that. We, in, the, in those early days, it was, a, 
It was a small group of us, but we did it. We built this thing, and God blessed. And, you know, you'll be telling the stories to your grandkids. Amen? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 24. We are coming into an interesting season now. Of course, for the next several weeks, um, we're going to be emphasizing the theme of the Holy Spirit. And there's a good reason for that, because coming out of Holy Week and the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is on the, you know, the liturgical calendar, if you will, there is 50 days between the day that Jesus rose from the dead and the day that the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. And so even here in our services, we are beginning already now to look from the empty tomb to the upper room. And we're walking down a road from, you know, the resurrection to Pentecost. And we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be, you know, uh, we're going to be exalting this theme of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then on Pentecost Sunday, I believe Russ is preaching. And I tell you, it's going to be a Holy Ghost hoedown, a blowout. We're going to turn this Olympia High School auditorium into the upper room. And there's going to be a mass outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. But we want to build towards that, and we want to begin to walk down that road. And so uh, I would like to just bring to your attention a story that comes from the book of Luke, and it's part of the story of the resurrection. It's actually something that happened on the very same day that Jesus rose from the dead, on that Sunday that we celebrated a week ago. How many of you know it wasn't just the ladies at the tomb that Jesus visited, but he was pretty busy that day? And the very next thing that he does is he goes and he appears to two disciples walking down the road to Emmaus. And we want to read that passage. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. It says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas said to him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these days? Can you imagine saying to the guy that just rose from the dead, are you the only one that doesn't know about this? And he said to them, what things? I love how Jesus sometimes plays dumb. I think he has a sense of humor. And they said to them, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. And moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses... And all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going on farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. But while he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Can we just pray again? Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would walk with us as you did with those disciples on the road to Emmaus. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to see you in a fresh way. And most of all, Lord, I pray that you would cause our very hearts to burn within us 
as you reveal yourself to us in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said. I read this interesting story that there was this lady, um, a socialite, kind of like what we would consider like a Paris Hilton or a, or a Kim Kardashian or something today. This is back in the 1800s. This lady's name was Madame Rekami. And it's interesting, her biography actually from that time is called The Biography of a Flirt. So it tells you kind of what kind of a, a woman we're talking about here. And the story goes that she was at a, a party. This is in the early 1800s. And she was mingling and she was talking to different people. And a man came up to her during the party and started hitting on her, flirting with her. And she tried to ignore him at first, but he was very persistent. I don't know if any of you ladies have met a guy like this. He just didn't know how to catch a, a hint. He didn't get the signal. And so finally, she just had to tell him bluntly. She said, sir, I am not interested. Please move along. Now, normally, if she had shown that kind of assertiveness, her girlfriends probably would have given her a high five or a, a pat on the back. But this time, everyone looked terrified and you know, she wondered why until later on she discovered that the man hitting on her was actually Napoleon Bonaparte. And the excerpt from her biography about this encounter says it like this. At a ball in Luxembourg, Napoleon, who had been absent from France for some years, was presented to the beautiful Madame Recamé, who for some unexplained reason received him coldly and with reserve, so rudely indeed that she did treat him that he was greatly piqued and somewhat hurt, and the memory of this unaccountable reception rankled in his mind for years. It is said that he spoke of it to Madame de Stael, and also that he made several attempts afterwards to meet Madame Recamé in order to wipe out the disagreeable impression which her reception had made upon him. She had no idea that the person she was giving a cold shoulder was arguably the most powerful man in the world at the time. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this where you were interacting with someone very famous or maybe somebody very powerful and you only discovered afterwards who you were talking to. I've had this experience on a number of occasions because I'm, I'm uh, not a sports fan at all. I don't really watch any sports. And many times people will tell me, do you know who that guy was you were just talking to? And I'll find out that he's some you know, football star with 100 million followers on social media or something. I'm like, I had no idea. I thought it was just some dude. I don't know if you've ever seen, by the way, this is a, a good reason why you should like treat everybody with respect because you never know who you're talking to. Jesus said, some of you, are entertaining angels without knowing it. There's this show that uh, is on, on television. It's a, a reality show called Undercover Boss. You ever seen that? And the premise of the show is that they'll get some really high level executive in a company like the owner or the president or the CEO and he will pretend to be someone who just got hired into the company and he'll play really stupid and he'll be sent into the back to wash dishes or whatever. And then he'll get to see the way the company is really running. And my favorite episodes, I've seen a few, the, the favorite ones are where you get an employee that's really rude to the guy and just treats him horribly. And then at the very end of the show finds out that this guy is actually their boss. And this is kind of what, was, what would happen there on the road to Emmaus. Here you have these two guys who... You know, they're walking down the road. The, the, the context is obviously Jesus has been crucified a few days earlier. He was buried. It was now Sunday, the day of the resurrection. And apparently the, the news of the empty tomb had already begun to circulate through the inner circles of the disciples. And as you can imagine, their minds were consumed by this event. They were... Their minds were racing. Their imaginations were probably playing games on them. They were discussing frantically all of the different implications and possibilities that could happen. You know, would the Jewish authorities now start going around trying to round up all of the other followers of Jesus and crucify them too? That was a very distinct possibility. And, and what really happened to the body of Jesus? I mean, we know that these ladies said that, that they saw him risen from the dead, but when the other disciples went there, they didn't find the body and they didn't find Jesus either. Were, were those really angels? Did he really rise? Is this all an elaborate hoax? And where does this leave us? Because I mean, 
We invested years of our life following this guy and believing every word that came out of his mouth, and now he's gone, and, and we don't know where he is. And I mean, if he didn't rise from the dead, then the whole thing was a lie, and we, we've got to go and start from scratch. But if he did rise from the dead, this is a bigger deal than any of us had ever imagined. So you can imagine all of the thoughts that were going on and the conversation that was taking place. And as they're talking to each other about these things, the boss himself shows up and starts walking with them on the road. And he's kind of like, hey, guys, what are you talking about? And, of course, just like um, it says in the, in the scriptures, it says that their eyes were actually kept from recognizing him. So they didn't realize who it was. And they treated him like, you know, some of those guys treat the undercover boss or like Madame Ricame treated Napoleon Bonaparte. They were actually kind of rude to him. And, and actually one of the disciples who happens to be named there in the scripture, how many of you would like your biggest blunder recorded in the Bible with your name right next to it? I mean, the only thing we know about Cleopas is that he put his foot in his mouth because Jesus was standing right there and he turns to him and he says, what's wrong with you, dude? Are you the only, he says, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that doesn't know the things that have happened? He's like saying, have you been under a rock or something? And Jesus is like, well, yeah, actually I have been for about three days. I think we need to take note of this because if this could happen to the disciples of Jesus who were actually physically with him, who knew him in the flesh, they had been with him, some of them, for years. They walked with him. They talked with him. They knew him personally. If it can happen to them that Jesus could be right there and they don't recognize him, I believe it can happen to anybody. How is it possible that you could be walking and talking with someone that you know and not recognize it. Well, you know, th there's different theories. Maybe it was a kind of supernatural, you know, covering of their eyes so that they were prevented from recognizing Jesus until the right time. But maybe there's a simpler explanation after all. Maybe it's just that busyness can hijack our awareness of the presence of God. Maybe worry and fear can cause us to not be able to see what is right in front of us? What if grief and what if anxiety and what if stress is actually able to blind us to the point that Jesus could be standing right there in front of us and we don't see him, we don't feel him, we're not aware of his presence? He wants to be able to, as we heard this morning, he wants to, to take the burden, the heavy burden off of us. He's standing there with arms open and hands outstretched, but we don't see it because we're so concentrated on the difficulties in our lives. And so what does Jesus do? It says to them, it says that he, he says to them in verse 25, oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. Listen to that again. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I, I bet you that was the most fascinating teaching that has ever been delivered on planet Earth. Imagine hearing a message about Jesus from the Old Testament delivered by the resurrected Jesus himself, unfolding in the scriptures, in all the scriptures, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, the things that were in the Old Testament concerning himself. Can I tell you something? The Bible is all about Jesus. Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't matter. The whole thing, everything before him points forward in time toward him. Everything after him points backwards in times back at him. He is the substance. He is the source. He is the reason for everything that we gather here to celebrate this morning. I wonder if he showed them from Genesis how he was that last Adam, the one who would crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the woman that had been prophesied about. I wonder if he showed them from Exodus how he was the Passover lamb, remember that lamb that had been killed on the day of Passover and the blood was sprinkled on the doors protecting the people inside from the angel of death. 
I wonder if he showed them from Leviticus how he was the perfect sacrifice. Remember, Leviticus explained all the things about the sacrifices, but as it says in Hebrews 10.4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should ever take away sin. And that's why the blood of Jesus opens a new and living way that as it says in, in, in 1 John 1.7, it cleanses us from all sin. I wonder if he showed them from Numbers, how just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. I wonder if he showed them from Numbers, from Deuteronomy, how he was the fulfillment of the promise that a prophet like Moses would come and would be a deliverer for Israel. I wonder if he showed them from Joshua, how he was the one who would lead his people out of the wilderness into the promised land and give them victory over their enemies and over all the power of darkness. I wonder if he showed them from Judges how he was that Samson figure who just like Samson, he destroyed more enemies in his death than in his life. Jesus in his death conquered his enemies and had victory over the power of the enemy. I wonder if he showed them from Ruth how he was that Boaz, that kinsman redeemer. I wonder if he showed them from First and Second Samuel how he was the promise the fulfillment of the promise that a king would come from the line of David. I wonder if he showed them from 1 Kings how he was the temple itself, the word made flesh, the dwelling place of God among men. I wonder if he showed them from 2 Kings how he is our Elijah, that one who ascends to heaven and sends the mantle of the Holy Spirit on those who believe. I wonder if he showed them from 1 Chronicles how he was the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. I wonder if he showed them how the renewal of God's covenant with Israel in 2 Chronicles foreshadowed a new and better covenant that would be made through his shed blood. I wonder if he showed them from Ezra how he was the ultimate temple that would be destroyed just like the old one but rebuilt in three days. I wonder if he showed them from Nehemiah how he was the one who would lead his people out of exile and bring them back into the land to a new life of freedom. I wonder if he showed them from Esther, how he was that Esther who laid down his life to save his people from the enemy. I wonder if he showed them how he was Job, remaining faithful to his father even through suffering and trials that he didn't deserve. I wonder if he showed them that he was that psalmist, sharing in our humanity and sympathizing with us in our weakness. I wonder if he, he revealed himself as wisdom in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, or as the loving bridegroom in the Song of Solomon, or as the suffering servant in Isaiah, or as the righteous branch in Jeremiah, or as the, the mourning prophet in Lamentations, or as the good shepherd in Ezekiel, or the son of man in Daniel, or the husband who took in the unfaithful wife in Hosea, or the one who poured out the spirit in Joel, or the coming one that Amos prophesied would judge the living and the dead. I wonder if he revealed himself as the one that would fulfill the prophecies of Obadiah to bring salvation to the people of God. I wonder if he showed that he was like that Jonah, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, but then resurrected from the dead. I wonder if he showed them that he was the ruler Micah prophesied about, who would come from the town of Bethlehem, who would be a shepherd to God's people and establish peace and justice. I wonder if he revealed himself as the one who comes over the mountains proclaiming good news in Nahum, or the everlasting one in Habakkuk, or the ultimate judge in Zephaniah, or the temple of God in Haggai, or the righteous branch in Zechariah, or the son of righteousness in Malachi that comes with healing in his wings. From Genesis to Revelation, it's Jesus, 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 Jesus in all the scriptures. In all of the scriptures and in all of the prophets, he unfolds to them and explains to them how it's all about him. I want you to notice something. Jesus didn't just say, come on, guys, snap out of it. It's me. Wake up. You know me. What's wrong with you guys? This is how most of us probably would have handled that situation. And I think that's often how we want the Lord to interact with us. We want him to just like speak with an audible voice from heaven and tell us exactly what to do about the situations that we're facing. Or we want him to just step in miraculously and change things and remove the obstacles and do miracles, and sometimes he does do that. 
so we don't discount it. But on the other hand, sometimes the greatest experiences that we have with God, the greatest revelations that we have of him, and those of you that have walked with him for any amount of time, you know what I'm about to say is true. Your greatest experiences with God were not some epiphany where a light shined down from heaven and you heard an audible voice. It was, it's when he revealed himself to you in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your most difficult moment, not from the outside, but from the inside out. You saw him and you have the revelation of who he was. Some people think, you know, if I just had a revelation of of Jesus, like a a vision, if I just could see him, then I would really believe, but that's not how it works. The disciples that were walking with him on the road to Emmaus had already seen him. They'd seen him for years, and still the Bible says that they were slow of heart to believe. And so Jesus decided to do it the other way around. Instead of revealing himself to their eyes so that their hearts could see, he decided to reveal himself to their hearts so that their eyes could see. And here's the question, what is it that causes us to recognize Jesus as he is? Now you might say it's the Bible, right? And that's definitely part of it. Jesus, like it says, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And as we'll see in a moment, this was having an effect on them. But as they came close to the village, still it says that they had not yet recognized him. Look what it says in verse 28. So they drew near to the village where they were going, and Jesus acted as if he was going to continue on further. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And so he went in and stayed with them. Think about this. They got to the place that they were going to stay, a hotel or something, I don't know, the, the prancing pony, days in, I don't know what it was. Some of you got that reference. And they are about to go in, and Jesus acts as if he's just going to keep on walking. And, and it actually says that, it actually says it that way. It doesn't say that he tried to keep walking. It says that he acted as if he was going further. In other words, it's not really what he wanted to do, but he wanted to see if they would compel him to stay. Or if they would be content to go on without him. I think that this is very often the posture of the Lord that so many times he will wait to see if we are willing to move on without him. You know there's that passage where where Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. You know that scripture? Some some people misinterpret that verse. They they think that Jesus is saying, without me you can't do anything. That's That's a different claim. There are actually many things we can do without him. We can preach without him. We can build churches without him. We can have worship services without him. He didn't say, without me, you can't do anything. He said, without me, you can do nothing. You know what that means is that without his presence, all of the things that we can do in our own strength at the end of the day, they amount to precisely nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Remember Moses, who prays to the Lord, and the Lord says to him at the beginning of the chapter, he says, I will go with you. And later on, Moses says, Lord, unless you go with us, do not send us up from this place. And when you're reading it, you're thinking, what's wrong with you, Moses? Pull yourself together. And, And we might be tempted to get frustrated at that kind of response. The Lord already told Moses, I will be with you. The Lord had no intention of ever leaving Moses to himself. But you see, it was that heart that said, I am not willing to go on without you, that the Lord loved so much. Remember the burning bush, it says that that when Moses turned aside to see, then the Lord spoke to him. God wasn't calling out to Moses as he was walking by obliviously on the path. The Lord waited until Moses turned aside. Remember the story of Elijah and Elisha when when, when Elijah found that young man who was to become his protege. The Bible says that Elijah threw his coat over Elisha and then walked away. And he waited for Elisha to chase after him. And then remember at the end before Elijah went up in in the whirlwind, the Bible says that several times he told Elisha, stay here, go back, don't come with me. 
It wasn't that Elijah didn't want Elisha there. It's that he wanted to test the heart of Elijah, Elisha if he really wanted it or if he was just going through the motions. And there is a point, my friends, where going through the motions will not bring you to the place of revelation and breakthrough. So this is, I've, I've got to move on very quickly. Here's the point. So you know, they get into the, the prance and pony and they're sitting there having lunch together and the Bible says that when he was at the table with him, in verse 30, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us? As he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures. I don't know what it was about that. It's, it's, it's actually fascinating. It says that as he broke the bread and blessed it, that was the moment they saw him. What, is, what does that remind you of? Breaking the bread and blessing it. Maybe the feeding of the 5,000? Could that have been it when they saw him do that just like he'd done it on the hillsides of Israel? They said, that's him. They recognized him. Or maybe it reminded them of the Last Supper when he took the bread of the communion and he broke it and he blessed it and they recognized him for who he was. Or maybe when he took the bread and he broke it, they saw the nail prints in his hands and they realized who he was. I don't know what caused their eyes to open. Maybe it was completely supernatural, but what I know is this. The reason that they were in that moment at that time was because their hearts were burning within them. It was the burning heart that made them keep walking with Jesus and listening while they walked along the way and he expounded to them the scriptures. It was the burning heart that caused them to urge him to stay with them. It was the burning heart that made them sit there at that table and listen until the moment of revelation. And the, the, the revelation eventually caught, came and they eventually saw him for who he was, but it was the burning heart that caused them to stay. This is what I'm talking about. There is a place in the experience of God that you will not get by any other means than a burning heart. I wonder how many times we miss our moment of visitation because we don't talk with him and walk with him and listen to him and linger to him. And the reason we don't do it is because our hearts are cold. And if your heart isn't burning, you're gonna be content with services and songs and poems and prayers. But if your heart is burning within you, you will not be content with mediocre Christianity. You are going to want something more. You're going to press in for the full revelation of who Jesus is. I'm convinced this morning, my time is up, I'm convinced that what we need more than almost anything in Christianity is more burning hearts. We need our hearts to burn again. We need this more than we need more theology. We need this more than we need more training. We need this more than we need more degrees, more services. We need a burning heart. Listen, I told you this was the beginning of the road to Pentecost. And those burning hearts eventually became burning tongues. And those same disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were sent to the nations of the world. But it all began in that place where their hearts were burning within them. Think about this, and I'll close. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and stand. Worship team, come back. I told you I always run out of time. And believe it or not, that's the shortest version I could think of. I want you to think about this. Those disciples, I don't know if it was those two, but certainly the disciples themselves, who had been with Jesus for over three years, they had seen all of his miracles. They'd heard all of his sermons. They could quote to you his words verbatim because they'd heard him say these things so many times. If they were alive today, they would receive honorary credentials from every denomination. If they were alive today, they'd have an honorary degree from every Christian university. These were the most qualified Christians that ever lived in history. And yet Jesus looks at these men and he says to them, you're not ready. There's something you need. Go to Jerusalem and wait until you are filled with power from on high. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power.